Okay, guys, I'd like to uh, welcome today to our uh, military studies class, Dr. Mike Fabian. He is a pure engineer in the Air Force, uh, started off, uh, as you'll hear, through the Air Force Academy and had a real dedicated career path in engineering. I did not do that. I was a civil engineer at Georgia Tech and then got into the flying program and then into the money part of the Air Force, the acquisition side. But it'll be good to hear a different take on Air Force career path. And he has used this after his career to end up at Emory Riddle, and he's a he's a, a professor there. And please ask him any questions. We have some good videos and all. If I can get the technology to work, everybody welcome uh, Mike Fabian. I'm Mike Fabian. I went to high school in uh, Leak City, Texas, Clear Creek High School. Um, when after that, I applied for college at a lot of different schools. I applied for Air Force ROTC, Navy ROTC, and Air Force Academy. I got all three, uh, and so then I had my choice of where I wanted to go, and I went decided to go to the Air Force Academy in Colorado Springs, Colorado. Right, let me show them uh, League City, Liddy, League City, Texas. There we go. My, my dad was in the service. We were assigned to Johnson Space Center. He was an astronaut there, and so. Uh, Lived, we lived on 1706 Davon Lane. There you in, are, right there, Nassau Bay. Nassau Bay. The guy across the street from us was George Abbey. He was the guy who decided who flew on space shuttle missions. He was an ex-Navy guy. Okay. That is yeah. uh, pretty cool. And what one thing you guys from Arizona need to see is in Texas. See all those blue things. You know, you know what blue things are? Yeah. yeah, we had a swimming pool in the backyard. It used to be. Does he look like a wealthy multi? <laughs> Everybody had a pool, man. <laughs> in Texas, <laughs> pools are very common, and they're very, they're relatively, they're cheap cars, I mean, yeah. really. And so, in Texas, uh, he grew up with a pool in the backyard. That does not mean he was well. Yeah. And, uh, and again, he was telling me that this is right on the water, but what, NASA is right here behind you. Yeah, literally. that's that NASA, NASA Johnson Space Center yeah. where they do all the mission control. Yeah. So, uh, he had that influence from point one, working with his dad. What would your dad do? NASA. He, he was a uh, he was a shuttle astronaut. He was on uh, STS-7 and STS-50G, two different missions. STS-7 is the one with Sally Ride. She just passed away. Cool. So. All right. Anyway, so then I went to the Air Force Academy. So I graduated in high school in 1980. I went to the Air Force Academy and graduated in '84. I was an aero major, aeronautical engineering major. And so when you, when you get done, if you're not PQ, pilot qual, and look, with these eyeballs, I'm not PQ. Okay, so I wasn't pilot qual, so you're going to be an engineer. You can do what, whatever your degree is. And so uh, then I went to Wright-Patterson Air Force Base in Ohio and did jet engine design. So I did that kind of stuff. And then I went to grad school and got a master's degree at University of Washington in Seattle. And then I went to be a teacher at the Air Force Academy. And then after teaching there for a while, they offered me a chance to go get a Ph.D., the doctorate degree. And so I did that. I went to Notre Dame in Indiana. Okay, I chose that place because there's no skiing and no backpacking. And so I did that so that I would get the degree done and not be bothered with side fun things to do. So a self-imposed exile in Indiana. Okay. And then I went back and taught there for a little while. And then I went to Edwards Air Force Base to the rocket lab. And so I brought a few little rocket, rocket motors from the rocket lab. And uh, that's, that's across the dry lake bed from the Air Force Flight Test Center that's famous from, from, the, from the movies, you know, like uh, the right stuff and all that's Edwards Air Force Base. And so I did three years there doing the rocket development. And I'll show you some clips and stuff on that. And then, uh, then I went to Edwards Flight Test Center and worked at the headquarters there. And then after that, I went to Albuquerque, New Mexico, and was uh, at the Air Force Safety Center doing directed energy weapons safety. And I'll show you some clips from that are directed energy weapons. Those are like like the Star Wars kind of stuff, but that's Hollywood, and this stuff's real. And then uh, and then after that, I went to Wright Patterson Air Force Base in Ohio, and I was the deputy director for the Propulsion Lab. We had a thousand employees, three hundred and fifty million dollar budget, and I was the number two guy behind a civilian. And we had facilities in California and uh, Wright-Patterson. So I, my, my career is basically engineering, teaching, things like that, all jet engines and rockets, a little bit of, of weapon safety. So I figured the next thing probably show, what, what do engineers do in the Air Force? Okay, let me show the uh, content on this. Yeah, no problem. Okay, so... 
So within the within the Air Force, you have a you have a spectrum of things that can be that can happen. So you could do research and development. So a lot of my career was research and development. And so these are things that may be 5, 10, 20 years away from being real weapons or real systems, real airplanes, real rockets, whatever. Okay, so you're, do, you're doing things that are, are still dreams to a lot, of, a lot of other people. You're working with, with uh, crazy, crazy things, crazy ideas. Another thing you do is once it, once it starts to come into the pipeline, you test it. And so that's someplace like Edwards Air Force Base, the Air Force Flight Test Center. There are weapons testing places. There's engine testing places. There's all kinds of different places around the uh, U.S. that do testing. And then after that, you, you acquire the system. And so a lot of engineers are doing that. So when they buy the F-22 or the F-35 or some new satellite system like GPS, there's a bunch of engineers that are in charge of helping work with the contractor to buy it, make good use of the taxpayer money, and get new systems that, that are going to enter the Air Force. Okay, question? Just hand. Okay, uh, that's right. No problem. Um, uh, and then, then the other thing is you got to keep the existing systems going. So, like the B-52 is over 60 years old. You got to keep it going. So you're buying new parts for it. You're upgrading radar systems. You're upgrading the weapons that are on it. So there's engineers doing that. There's other things called battle damage repair. If we ever get in a shooting fight. The planes are going to go out, get torn up, and come back, and they got to go out again. So engineers figure out how damaged can it be and still go out again. And some pilots got to jump in that thing with duct tape in places and some epoxy here and there, and off they go again. Okay, because it doesn't end for maintenance. Okay. I, again, in stealth technology, which we've been a little bit, uh, you realize stealth technology on being invisible to radar. So I, even if you have a perfect stealth plane, and it, you change the oil, and you drop a panel off the aircraft and put the panel back up, it creates an edge. So then you have to treat it. You have to make the edges disappear. Because otherwise, if you have an edge, it's going to reflect technology, radar beams. Uh, and so there's maintenance, a huge right. amount of maintenance on these vehicles also. Yeah. And then there's logistics centers. And so UPS likes to talk about logistics. They're the king of logistics in terms of delivering things and getting things done. Okay, well, there's a whole Air Force Logistics Command that that's their, their business. They've been doing it longer than UPS of keeping things going, repairing things, and, and making the Air Force operate. And then another specialized area is engineers analyze enemy systems. You analyze enemy systems to know what the weaknesses are. You also analyze enemy systems to know what our weaknesses are. So you, you, you analyze plane to plane, rocket to rocket, bomb to bomb, how things are going on, on, the, on some it's Russian or Chinese or some Middle Eastern country, what they're up to. And then you try and figure out countermeasures. So stealth is an example of, of that, trying to beat the other guy's capabilities, sneak past them. So that's a that's a quickie on on what that is. Now the next next slide will will say, hey, what are these careers? Um, when you go through high school, there aren't engineers or engineering classes you take. So a lot of people don't know what engineering is. It's lots of math and science. Engineers build things. Scientists do theory and create ideas of things. Engineers actually build the, the items. Okay. So I listed aeronautical and uh, and astronautical engineering. That's the airplanes and space stuff. Mechanical engineers do deal with anything internal to those planes and vehicles, things like that. Electrical and computer engineers, it's all the gizmos and electronics, software, and all that has to be done. Flight test engineers, they're the ones that take something up that hasn't been tested and they probe the edge of the flight envelope to figure out if the thing's going to fall apart or not. That's a very dangerous job. And then project engineers, as we build things and put things together, you've got to figure out what does it take to do it right? What does it take in terms of time? What does it take in terms of budget? So that's, that kind of gives you some feel for what, the, what those engineering career fields are. Next one. Okay, so this is, this is I, I gave you a, a quick summary of what I did, Clear Creek High School, Air Force Academy. I got a master's in aeronautical engineering and astronautical engineering at University of Washington. How did you, as a high school kid, decide to go to the Air Force Academy? Um, I, I had, my dad had been assigned there when I earlier when I was a kid. I had met some of the cadets. Did to know. your dad go? No, he didn't go to the Air Force Academy. Went to University uh, Washington State University. Okay. So, military family, you travel all over the place. So, so you were influenced by where your 
parents lived. Right. But then did other kids go for your high school? Uh, I was the only one that went to the Air Force Academy. There was another kid that went to the Naval Academy. Okay, so you had to make all these application processes right. individual and, and yeah. So you get you, you apply and it's they, but the school gets real excited because it's a scholarship worth so many dollars. It makes the school look good. Bigger or smaller? Would you say? Uh, we had each class was about 500 students, so I, wow, not bigger. Well, okay. we have about 400. You yeah, so a little, little about in the same. Park. Same same ballpark. It's 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 comparable. Oh, I thought every single period. Uh, no, <laughs> no, 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 no. Meaning, meaning, no, no. Like like sophomores, juniors, okay. seniors, five hundred. I mean, that's. Then when then when I was like, oh no, I was like, okay. That, no, that that, that 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 you you don't get classes of five hundred in a chemistry except, class at freshman at college, big university. Maybe. Yeah, big big <laughs> universities they have classes of five hundred, and the prof professor's a little person down at the bottom. <laughs> And they don't know what they don't know your name at all. Excuse me, what's your name? I'm in your class. <laughs> they don't. They don't know. You. So their job is not. To pay. Their job yeah. So is to I, teach you. I major. I majored in aero engineering because it seemed like a neat thing to do. I went in the propulsion track. They had tracks you could choose little sub areas that you wanted. So I did the propulsion track. And so my senior project was designing a jet engine, and I, I was the compressor guy, design a compressor for a jet engine. And so that was our senior project. Then when I graduated, I went to Wright Pat to design jet engines. So the Air Force actually made good use of my degree. They don't do that all the time in, in a lot of places, but I got to. Okay, here, yeah. let's show them right where Wright. Uh, gee, guys, have you ever known anybody in the Air Force, the beginning of flying named Wright? Right, yeah. the Wright Brothers, Dayton, Ohio. Guys who worked in our bicycle shop. Yeah, yeah. Well, guess what, their guess bicycle shop. Is it Dayton, Ohio? <laughs> Patterson Air Force Base. Yeah. Uh, let's see. Ohio, Ohio. I recognize that. Hopefully. Maybe. Let's see if it'll find it. Actually, Dayton. Dayton, Ohio, Dayton. it'll find. Just east of town. Yes. And uh, so I worked at that, I worked at a lab. It, the lab had been around since since the Wright brothers' days. They they did early early engine testing figuring out spark plugs and comp high compression ratios and superchargers and all that stuff that that people use in drag racing and all that came that came from the airplane industry trying to make the engines better and then the jet engines came along and that's what the place works now yeah, yeah so Wright Patterson Air Force Base is a uh, is a huge resource uh, for the Air Force that's where all the acquisition was I worked at the Pentagon a lot but I go to Wright Patterson a lot for all the, the, the yeah. new ideas, current ideas are being worked on. F-22s. They have and a right. great Air Force Museum right there. Yeah. yeah. So. Um, near Fairborn, sir? Yeah, it's near Fairborn. Fairborn. Lots of people live in Fairborn. Yeah. Yeah, so it's. Now, what I was going to ask, building a jet engine is a lot, is it a lot more complicated than or simpler, would you say? It's, yeah, historically it takes longer to develop a jet engine than it does to develop the plane. Wow. Okay. And it's. It's because the temperatures and the pressures and all that makes it very, very difficult task. Really, so so, so your engine doesn't melt on you. Right. Or it doesn't shake itself apart. Right. So, yeah, no big deal. So. You're in the middle of your flight and you, what's that yeah, smoke? So. Oh, yeah, that's my engine melting. So it's, mm. it's important. No big deal. So. Do you want to see some video clips or what do you want to do next? Uh, or, or I can open it up to questions. You guys got any questions on? on how many any... times did he say he was stationed overseas and went to Saudi Arabia? Zero. I'm an engineer. Why would he, if he's designing the next generation planes? He, you know, other engineers who may be in the, the maintaining of the planes or the installation of the systems may go over to the uh, you know wars to do this. But again, he was so futuristic that all of his assignments are here in America. So when you hear people say, "I don't want to get in the military because I might have to be stationed in Korea, or I might have to go to the desert." Yes, well, this is an example of a career path that you never leave America if you don't want to. I did 25 years and never left the U.S. for assignments. I took hops. I took. Did you go to different states? Yeah, I went to a lot of different states. I took military hops where you go fly over and go visit Europe and for 10 bucks each way. <laughs> so, yes. I've been at Riddle for three years. Every Riddle for three years. So. Yes. Um. <laughs> it's all right. It's all right. Uh, 
Oh, okay. Have you ever even tried flying a plane? Or... Yeah, I flew, I flew Cessnas in high school. I soloed. Uh, I used to chase cows out in the pastures. There. I li we lived outside of Houston. <laughs> Don't tell high school kids. <laughs> so, so you know, it's not supposed, well, to chase cows. not supposed to chase cows. But it was a little, it was a little, little strip where one of the one of the landing strips was grass, the other was uh, was paved, and you could go check out. I borrow my parents' credit card and go check out an airplane, and go and go fly. And that's, I, I and but with bad eyes, I couldn't be an Air Force pilot. So that's. But I, I did want to fly, and I know all about stall and slow flight and all those other neat things of, of the flight envelope. No, I know this is probably a dumb question, but you ever hear that saying, you know, you, you don't have to be a rocket scientist? Do you ever like joke with people, I am a rocket scientist? <laughs> yeah, I, <laughs> I, I, don't, I, I don't do it too much. I mean, it's, I'm, it's, there's, I don't know if you watch Big Bang Theory, the scientists versus, <laughs> scientists versus engineers, there's all kinds of cultural differences between them. So officially, I'm an engineer, okay? And so, <laughs> science, because scientists just do theories mostly, and I build things, okay? So that's, that, engineer. engineer, okay? So there's a, there's a, there's a difference, so. So, yes. Uh, what did you want to be when you were a kid, like compared to what you What did I do as a kid? What did you want to be? Oh, what did I want to be? Um, when I was a little little kid, my dad was in the military and he was never home, so I wanted to be a milkman because the milkman always got to, ah! always got home early. Okay, okay, because you didn't I didn't see my dad. Okay, for a long long time, he was in the Vietnam War and gone for months at a time. So when I was a little kid, I wanted to be a milkman because I wanted to see my dad. Okay, so that's I mean, so that that changes. But I was always good at math and science. I'm dyslexic, so English is hard for me. I can remember in in, in English class writing essays and not being able to spell the word of, and so then you have to rewrite the whole sentence because you oh I can't spell of I don't I don't see what it is so you rewrite the whole sentence to avoid it, so. Yeah. And no, that's no spell check. Smart to be able to have to rewrite the sentence yeah. not with the word of in there. Yeah, because it's you know you're, when you're dyslexic you can't you can't tell how to spell it and you're not sure how how things go together. Is that the same with letters? Is that, no, is that the same with numbers? Some people have it with numbers. Some people have it have it with with words. You, you Einstein know. Einstein had it. Einstein had it real bad. Yeah. Is this like for me when I read like a W looks like an M? Uh huh. And so it's like. Yeah, I used to write. Yeah, yeah, I used to write my name E K I M backwards, you know, and and, and the letters invert for Mike, you know, because it doesn't in your brain it doesn't matter which order it is that all the letters are there. What's 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 your problem? You know. <laughs> See what I mean? it's, and so it's it's one of those it's one of those funny things. So anyway, so I'm good at math, good at science. So I don't I don't want to be a history teacher because that involves reading and writing reports and all that. No way, man, because that's not my strength. So I was looking for things that were math and science, and engineering was one of those things. So I, I, and luckily they have spell checkers and all that on the, on the computers. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, so that helps, you know, so. All right, let, let's show, uh, let's explain some of these videos. Okay, here. no problem. What is this camera number three south wall? Uh, they're, yeah, they're behind you, yeah. Right. Okay, this is a this is a solid rocket motor firing. This is the this is officially T triple S. It's this uh, technology for the sustainment of strategic systems is what the name of the program is. So it's to help the ICBM fleet have current technology in case in case we need to use those things. And so this is a solid rocket motor segment, and the guy's going to do the countdown and then fire the rocket. The rocket has thru thrust vectoring, so you'll see that too. One second before we start. What does S the, the technology for the sustainment of strategic systems. Like strategic, like strategic rockets, strategic missiles. The intercontinental ballistic missiles we still have, right? They can go anywhere in the world, deliver nukes. We got to sustain them. They come up with new ideas. So these are engineers that are trying to figure out when these things were made, it could be 20 years ago. That company that made it, the sub suppliers are all gone. So you've got to find new sub suppliers with new materials to make sure you can still make the thing go. So you got to test all this stuff because you don't want to blow up over you and fall back down. So. T minus 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. So you can see how hot the, hot the exhaust plume is. So that's solid propellant. It's like your Estes model rocket, except a whole lot more power in there. And you can see, see, the, see the vector, see how it's moving? 
See how the, the, the plume is moving left and right? So it's doing thrust vectoring. That's, there aren't fins on those rockets because they come out of a silo. So you don't have fins like an Estes model rocket does. So the motor, rocket motor, has to do the steering. So you, you have all that controlled by gyros, and it, it does the steering. So that's, that's just a medium-length burn. Where was that? that that's from Edwards Air Force Base, the rocket. Happening to it. That's, that's the end, end of the last bit of propellants burning out. In, in reality, it would drop. Oh, that thing that lowered down. That's a, cool, that's a cooling thing. So it'll either, either quench it with carbon dioxide or water so they can do a post-mortem on what it looks like inside there. They want to look to see, did it start to burn through the sides? Is it still good? You know, if you, after you fire an Estes rocket and you hold that piece of, of cardboard, it's super warm to the touch and it's because it's it, that heat load inside there to send the propellant out. So they make that cardboard thick enough, it's going to hold the pressure and not burn up. Cardboard? For the Estes, not for this. Little rockets we shot up. Oh, the little okay. Estes model rockets? Like on no, no, this is... So did vaporize cardboard. No, it's not cardboard. All right, so how about the F-22 then? Here's F-22. This is a, this is in an engine test cell showing thrust vectoring. You can see the shock diamonds, so it's supersonic flow coming out of that nozzle. And so you can see it doing thrust vectoring. And then they'll show the F-22 do a, do a quick see loop. See, guys, the F-15E, which I the the thrust only went out one way. But... They invented a way of moving the vector of the thrust. And that way, instead of me having to use flight controls to do a turn, you know, pull the stick, push the stick, you could actually move the vector of the engine to turns. So now, you'll see a little clip of that. Yeah, you'll see a clip here. Yes? I got, I got one question. The super tank, um, what, are, what are they called? The, the, the shock diamonds? That, the, yeah, super shock diamonds. Is that another replacement for, for a Something? No, it's a shot. What you're seeing, it's, it's, it's flow physics. It's what you're seeing when you see things, when you see that, that glowing and lines and cones and things like that, that's supersonic flow. And so it's going faster than the speed of sound. And that, that's going to help you go faster. And so rockets will do it. All kinds of things will do shock diamonds. So lots of cool, lots of cool posters have shock diamonds or mock diamonds. So that, that, this is in a test cell, so they'll spray water down the test cell. So you see, you see the water being sprayed to keep it alive. And then here's the F-22 with thrust vectoring, and watch it do this turn. See, so it's thrusting, and watch how fast it comes back around. So, okay. Yeah, that, that's very revolutionary, because it, when you're actually in dog fighting with other fighters, the person who turns quickest kills, as the saying goes. Yep. So if you're flying in a big, fast plane and you're going slow, the guy that can turn quick is going to kill you. Okay. In this situation, if you have a 16 just going like this, you have an F-22 that can vector and use your threat, your flight controls. You will turn quicker and you'll kill it. So this is revolution. This is, this is one of the neat about the modern yeah. jets is the modern engines. All right. Let's see. What was the other one here? One. Whatever. Whatever. What else do we want to look at? Uh, <laughs> hover test? Hover test we can look at. Where, where is that one? Hover over here? MKV hover. Okay, let, 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 me, let me explain what you're going to see. I don't know if you remember in the Star Wars movie where Luke puts on the helmet and he, he fights that little ball that goes... Psh, 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 psh. <laughs> That's Hollywood, man. That doesn't exist. This is real and it exists, okay? This is a kinetic kill vehicle. So if the enemy launches bad stuff at us, either nuke warheads or chemical weapons... We have systems, they already exist today, they, the Navy has some, there's some stationed in Alaska. We can launch a rocket, this thing sits on top of the rocket, so the rocket gives it its speed, just like the gunpowder in a bullet gives the bullet its speed. So the rocket's going to give it its speed, then what you're going to see is the maneuverability to maneuver around. And so the warhead's coming this way in outer space, this thing's coming this way and can maneuver around, and it will hit it. It's a kinetic kill vehicle. Kinetic means kinetic energy. One half mv squared is kinetic energy. There's no explosive on board it or anything like that. It hits the other thing at such a high, high speed that it destroys the other thing, which could be the chemical weapon or the warhead a, a, atomic bomb coming to the United States. Yes? It's a part of the defense system. It's the part of the national defense system. Yes. So you're going to see a video clip of we don't we have we're not launching it off the top of the rocket. We're just letting it fly by itself in a hangar. You're going to see a blue dot in the distance. The blue dot in the distance is like the infrared glow, the the heat glow of the enemy warhead coming the opposite direction. Okay. So, so 
It, we don't have we don't give it the forward speed so you're going to see it do if i don't know if you guys you guys do xyz coordinates right so the the rocket gives it the x velocity well we're testing it in the hangar so we don't have the x but this thing's going to demonstrate the y and the z so it's going to maneuver around remember the little star wars thing with the ball no, roll take roll take okay and you'll see it it's pretty neat okay so this is a multiple kill vehicle. So this particular one has a mothership. That's the main thing. Then see all those little white ones? Those little white ones are babies, and they can do the same thing. They, they can fly and maneuver just like that thing. What? Yeah, okay. So This is unclassified. This is the good stuff we have. It's unclassified. Think about it. Okay, so the blue light in the distance would represent the enemy vehicle, and so if you gave it the forward speed, it would have this tremendous forward speed, the enemy vehicle would be coming, and so you see once it runs out of fuel, it, so it, that, it does those little maneuvers in the final end game, and it's a, the equivalent of a bullet hitting a bullet, except bullets are slow. Okay. Yeah, this is just another oh, angle. This is at Edwards. If it hit, if that velocity, you'll hit that thing. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And it'd be, it'd be good. It'd be traveling way faster than F-22s. Okay. Way faster. Okay. Okay. So that's what that one is. So anyway, it gives three views just so you can see. What? It's it's pulsing. It's pulsing because the pulses are to offset gravity because you're doing this on Earth. When it's up in space, it can use those extra pulses for maneuvering. Then you see the side pulses to do the... Left and right. Left and right and up and down. Okay, so that's that's real stuff. Not Hollywood. Okay. You can see it something. Yeah, it's fire right afterwards. So it's got there's ropes and cables in that whole cage so that if it ever flew out of control, the cables would hold it. And then and the ropes are there to try and minimize the damage because they're gonna they'll clean it up afterwards and then they can use it. The white things the white things, that's a mothership and uh, twelve babies. And so if the, en if the enemy launches multiple missiles, oh. you can launch this thing. The mothership can go after one target. Each of the babies can go after another one. And the, each, of those, each of those little things has a sensor on the front, motors on the side to fire and maneuver. One of those and it, little yeah, one of the, that's how small they've gotten it. Yeah. That's awesome. Yeah, I just talked about the ICBM. It's about the size of a pipe hole. Oh, yeah. It's really tiny. Yeah. That's it. Okay. okay, let's talk about direct. Oh, we got scramjet. Scramjet. This is a this is a scramjet test at NASA. Explain them what a scramjet. Uh, I will. Okay, so this is at NASA Langley in Virginia, and so uh, what you what you're going to see is it's going to come out of the floor. The wind tunnel's already going at Mach five, five times the speed of sound. A scramjet is a supersonic combustion ramjet. It means the flow inside the engine never goes below supersonic speeds. So if you, you have to squirt the fuel in, light the fuel off, and burn the fuel inside the engine while everything's going supersonically. If you do it wrong, you've got the coolest flamethrower in the world. Okay? <laughs> so you've got to do it right. Okay? So, so what you're going to see is that you're going to see this thing. The tunnel's already running at Mach 5. There's a little elevator shaft that lifts the engine up into the Mach 5 flow, and then they'll start the engine. Okay? So that's what you're going to see on this. So again, this test is so is it? You never think about this. Mach 5. So you're telling so me that three times, it, 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 it can go five times the speed of sound. Oh, yeah. It's the X-51 program. It's X-51 program. They've flown it three times. The first time was successful. The other two times they've had some trouble. They got one left. Okay, all, and the program is only to test the engine. Okay, it's not, not a warhead. It's not a, it's not a missile. Like a weapon on this thing? You, be lethal? Oh, yeah, because it's flying so fast. Speed, yeah. speed it's it's kinetic better. energy, one-half mv squared. M is mass, v is velocity, energy. squared. Energy is me. Kinetic energy. Okay, so here it is coming out of the floor. You can see that little lip at the front where that's the intake. Okay, so it's, you can see, the, you can see the, the, the high speed flow kind of changing light, light colors. And then it's going to light off at the back so they get ignition. They use a special fuel to get ignition. Okay, and then they run it on kerosene. So this is kerosene fuel which are big molecules. NASA did this with hydrogen. Hydrogen are little tiny molecules. It's easy to do. This is hard to do with kerosene. So, so, so it's going right now? Yeah, it's, it's running. See the flame out the back? So, it's, so that's light you know, being up in the atmosphere going five times the speed. So, so you're, you're 100,000 feet plus doing Mach 5. Okay, so a trip from Prescott to New York City wouldn't take any time at all. Okay, that's and so there's 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 ideas of supersonic supersonic and hypersonic transports to go to Tokyo 
And you get on, and less than an hour later, you're there. Yeah. From where? From L.A. That would be so cool. Yeah, because if you do it fast, you can get there fast. Okay, so that's enough. But the problem is, like we talked about my science flight class last year, is transitioning from ground to altitude to Mach 5. How do you do that? Because scramjets work supersonic. So yeah. You've got to get supersonic to begin with, like the launch. So that there are complexities of being able to have maybe two engines on each plane to make this happen. And uh, it's not there yet, but it's really a cool thing. Now. So they, they'd have to have one engine to act. Get it started. They don't know. We need smart engineers like you to go figure this stuff out. <laughs> There's ideas where you start with a jet engine and then you and, then and then you cocoon you cocoon the jet engine with doors, and then the scramjet takes you the rest of the speed. And then when you start to slow down, you you open those doors and the jet engine turns back on and you land nicely at the runway. Pretty great. Okay, so fun fun stuff. Uh, Let's talk about directed energy. Okay. Uh, well, then the next, the next active denial. Active, active denial. Next couple of clips you'll see is the active denial system. So these are all things that I've been involved with as an engineer. Everything you've seen, those are things that I was involved with. Okay. And so uh, the active denial system, I was shot by this thing. It's a millimeter wave, so you know what microwave. Microwave has to do with the length of the, length of the, the length of the wave, and microwaves cook food. Millimeter wave is is a different length, and so it doesn't penetrate as far into food or skin or whatever. So this direct energy weapon is known as the active denial system. It penetrates your skin a 64th of an inch. That's where your nerve endings are. So it's an invisible beam. It penetrates your skin a 64th of an inch, and it makes your nerve endings think they're on fire. Yes, question. Yeah, yeah the, the non-technical term is ray gun, but yes, it's the active denial system. <laughs> yeah. Neural shock. Oh, God. Okay, so so we'll we'll show we'll show some clips on it. Okay, so there's there's a version with a hump mounted on top of a Humvee, and that's the one that I got shot with. What, what, is, what is it? <laughs> it's it's a great big antenna on top of a Humvee. We'll show you. We'll show you. So, it's, so give them the background then on this picture here. Oh, okay. God. Okay. So here's this is. This is at an army base, I think it's Fort Benning, and this is, they, these guys are playing with Russian AK-47s, they're acting like enemy snipers, and they've got, they've got this active denial system down on the street looking at the windows trying to spot snipers, okay? So this is like war game stuff. This is war game stuff, okay? And so this, guy, this guy's going to get hit by it when he leans out the window, and you watch his reaction, okay? And it doesn't damage your skin, but your brain says, this is not good, my skin is on fire. Okay, and it's because of the way it penetrates and fires off the synapses and all those nerve ends. So you can roll this clip. Okay, so he's gonna lean out. Oh my God. Okay. Now watch, he'll look at his arm because his brain's telling him it's cooked. See how he's looking at his arm? It's, it's that's just sunburn. It's not that's not from the thing. But his brain's telling him it's on fire, and he has to keep checking. It's not on fire, but the pain was so bad he he moved. Okay, so he gets a shot off, but he doesn't lean out the window as much. I'm scared. It's like, <laughs> yeah. See how see how see how his behavior changed after that? Yeah. That looks like it hurt. Now does it leave? Now it continues. Yeah. So he gets off a shot. Yes. What are the bullets he's using? I don't know if he's using blanks or sometimes they'll use live ammo at a target and so they'll set a target down range and then that and, and then so they that, that what because they're trying to see they're trying to see how well does he do shooting and how much does this mess up his shots. Okay, now active denial system is a non lethal weapon. It's designed to push crowds back. It's taking on a sniper is probably not its main purpose, but they were just playing around in war games to see what could it do to help the war fighter. I, the, I can't, can't talk about that. <laughs> um, no, that's, that's what the war game was for. It's yes. What its limits are. The, yeah, what its limits are. Yep. Yep. Um, yeah. It's lasting do you know, It leaves lasting damage on your nerve. It doesn't doesn't leave any lasting damage. Oh, that's like if it's like continuous, would it be? Oh, well, you can show this clip. Okay. You'll get a kick out of this. Results from the second. Okay, so that little thing in the middle is a sweep second hand for how long the, the gun's being fired. Okay, and hands over the head means quit shooting me, it hurts too much. Okay, so as you watch this, you'll see people put their hands over the head. That's the signal to the gunner. 
Yeah. But that's, that, that's what it looks like, a Humvee with an antenna on the top. So you'll see infrared camera views, you'll see normal camera views. Now you'll see the gunner's view with the sweep second hand. There were four days of field tests conducted during both day and night conditions. <laughs> so, it's an, so it's an invisible beam, but he knows I got to get out of here, okay? Because the skin just gets hot. It was controlled by security forces. When a confrontation near the entrance. So these guys are throwing tennis balls to act like rioters, so nobody gets hurt. But that's just kind of a war game of a few distribution or voting or whatever. <laughs> all they all guns. Guns. Yeah. If they, if all they have to do is this, everybody gets hit. Yeah, they don't even have to do that. They just shoot the beam. How wide is it? Yeah. So that, that's, it, it keeps going, but that's, we can show another one if you want. It's fine. It's all about you getting Okay, so I did this. I did this down in Eglin, Florida. I went to I went to the, the Air Force Base in Eglin, Florida. They had the Humvee on the beach. What they were practicing with was guys had PVC pipes with a little laser pointer, and they were acting like they were the Somali pirates with uh, RPG grenades. Okay, and so they would have a piece of PVC pipe with a little laser pointer inside, and there would be a target on shore, and so they're in a little boat cruising around trying to shoot that thing. <laughs> Meanwhile, the Humvees on shore acting like it's on the boat trying to push the pirates away. And so the day I was there, they turned the gun down the beach, and I got shot, okay? <laughs> and so there were a bunch of us that volunteered to get shot, get shot by it, and it hurts like heck. You know, it feels where like did, where it, did it hit you? the whole dang body. <laughs> the, the, the whole body feels like you're on fire. It feels like it feels like uh, you're a marshmallow in a campfire. So it fires things. Uh huh. No, it's like, like yeah, it's it's it. yeah, they're actually. Oh, oh yeah. see, do you see how that blossom that means? Yep. Can it go through like walls or something? It does. It, it, that walls walls are are probably too thick for what it's doing. It's it's a crowd control device. So the issue is if an airplane goes down or a, a bomb goes off. <laughs> you know, for a Humvee someplace, how do you keep the bystanders away while you rescue the people? And so this thing, you can sweep them back and not have to fire guns at them. And if the bad guys keep coming, well, then you're probably going to use real guns back on them. Yes? <laughs> that, that red line, that's the beat. See? It, 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 that red little thing, that's yeah. firing. Yeah. So pretty neat. And how, how was the length of I can't talk about the lab. <laughs> oh, okay. You can't tell us the firing distance? Uh-uh, because that's... Yeah you, yeah, yeah, you have to understand that when you start talking about what capabilities are... Remember I told you one of the other organizations within the military is to study the enemy's systems? Well, guess what? The enemy's got engineers doing the same thing of our stuff. <laughs> right? So God, let's take the right into the NS100 class. Okay, so okay you, we got eight minutes. You want to show that? Yeah, about yeah. That? Okay, so this uh, I, I can pass this. I can pass this around if you want. Um, this is a this is a thruster off a of Gemini capsule. The, one, one of Gemini? The, Gemini, one of the early early ones that the astronauts rode in, and it's a it's a little thruster. It uses two different propellants, and it's hypergolic. Anybody know what hypergolic means? That's a good SAT. Higher than. <laughs> Hypergolic means when the two chemicals meet, they explode. Okay, so you don't need a spark plug because as soon as the two chemicals meet, they explode. So that's very nice because then you don't have to worry about a spark plug failing if you're riding in the capsule. Yes, yeah. the two chemicals were nitro, uh, nitrogen tetroxide, and uh, monomethyl hydrazine. Monomethyl hydrazine. <laughs> I, was, I was about to say. Was... And then here's, here's another little little thruster. This is a, this is a satellite thruster. And so it's a it's a monopropellant thruster, so it only uses one propellant. Ding the ding the nozzle. But uh, the propellant comes in here, it decomposes with a catalyst in there, and comes out as a hot gas, and that maneuvers the satellite. Wow. So is it, which satellite is it? Sputnik or no? Not no, Sputnik. it's not Sputnik. That's that would be Russian. You can't get a hold of Russian <laughs> Russian stuff. Which one is uh, this one? Uh, it's it's a test one. So it's been flown on other ones. It's it's a te it's a test one. So <laughs> just just so you see that. Yeah. Any questions? No. Yeah, he's checking. He's playing, playing camera games. <laughs> anyway, those are all projects that I was involved with. You, you know, when you're an engineer, you just don't know what projects you'll get involved on. But it's all been it's all been exciting stuff, and it's fun to see things move forward through through this through the system. Yeah. So with the um, the ray thing, it doesn't like the paint doesn't linger. It's just no. It's it's.
It's instantaneous. It's instantaneous. Your nerve endings. In fact, you, they, your eyes blink. The body knows to protect the eyelid, you know, the eyes. So the eyelids and the eyelids are thick enough that nothing happens to your eyes. Really? Yeah. I mean, it's it. The body, the body's been around a long time. It knows how to protect itself. <laughs> and you and your nerve endings tell you when things are bad. It's just like touch. It's just like touching a hot pot. You let go. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yes. I don't know. It's it's. It, it, they 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 were really working hard on it when w during the I Iraq War, and the the issue always always becomes is can you can you use this thing and not have lose the CNN war, oh. Me meaning that, will the television say you're being mean and nasty people <laughs> for doing this? Now the reason it was invented is so that you didn't have to shoot and kill people, which was it's just about guaranteed to lose the CNN <laughs> evening news war. But uh, that, that, so I don't know. I don't know if it, it'll it'll move along or not. Uh, quest, first question over there. Uh, could a ray gun potentially kill someone if it was strong enough? Like, could it melt someone? Uh, I worked on I worked on the I worked on part of the airborne laser program, and that one is strong enough to kill people. Its purpose was to shoot down missiles, but it was strong. It was strong enough to kill people. I mean, it's technology. Technology, you can do that, but you can do that with a thirty out six bullet in World War Two. Okay, so. Uh, <laughs> I mean, it's, it's all, all depends on the method, yeah. Uh, have you ever been around or seen a rail guns? A rail guns? I have not. I've seen video clips of rail guns. The Navy's big on rail guns. They like it because you don't have to then have gunpowder inside the ship. You generate electricity and shoot a rail gun, and so it makes it safer for the crew. It's all videos of a rail gun, and it's all video of someone making like their own Gun yeah. Just like with all the metal rod, just like. Oh yeah, you, you, you can do it. It's there, there's there's science fair projects to do that. Uh, rail guns are really really cool. Yep, that's neat stuff. Yes. Does a rail gun not make it sound? It's 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 invisible and it's completely silent. You don't hear a thing. Wow. All you do is feel all you do is feel heat. And what's funny about it is when they're shooting the guy next to you, you can feel little wisps of heat. Meanwhile, he's screaming and trying to get out of the way. Okay, and 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 the, those wisps of heat is kind of like when you're sitting around a campfire and the wind direction changes and you feel a little, it's wow. it, it's kind of like it feels like that when you when you're not the guy being shot, but the next guy to you is going, I gotta get out of here. Yes. Um, I don't really understand if it doesn't really harm your body except for the brain making your brain think that it's harming you. Yes. How could it, how could it potentially kill someone? That that I didn't say that one could kill somebody. I said the airborne laser with a big a bigger. That's it's not powerful enough to do it. It's not powerful enough. Yeah, it's not powerful enough. It like No. conceivably conceivably, but anything can put you in shock. I mean that's a, 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 a light a, a lightning strike very close to you has got such loud noise that could put you in shock. So first aid first aid is always treat for shock. Right? You guys learned that in first aid, I hope. But is he breathing? Yeah. yeah. His eyes dilated. Yeah, I think he's in shock. Yeah. Well, you said it only goes so far into the skin. Could you change that so it goes, you know, further into the skin? And, yeah, um, yeah, you, you could, but it would, you'd probably lose effectiveness because, because deeper, deeper into your skin, you don't have as many nerve endings, and so it doesn't, it doesn't, it doesn't cause the same effect. All right. Okay, so well, the, they, they, basically, they basically tuned it to that frequency because that's where your nerve endings are. Well, okay. would that make your muscles like spasm or? Uh, I don't. I don't think. I don't think it would do that because it, you, muscles muscles work by electric signal, and so I don't think. I don't think it would do that. There there are other sound ideas of very very loud sounds for crowd control, and things like that. Certain frequency of sounds. One yep. thing I heard of um, <clears throat> while watching the show was it's a riot control system. It has like eighty. Rubber, solid rubber BBs, put in this steel container, and they, they're put outside of embassies. And what's ha what happens is a charge is set to them, and it explodes. There's no shrapnel. There's no explosives that you're hit. It's just these solid rubber BBs that hit you all over, like rubber bullets. Yeah, yeah. All, except except they pack with this large space, yeah. and they just go boom, they explode, and yeah, they, 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 it hurts. It, they, we're trying to do things nicely as best you can. Don't want to hurt the bad guys too much. <laughs> okay, we would like to uh, thank Dr. Fabian Cummins. Thank you. Thank you. Could I have McGee, why don't you uh, get ready to do it? Could I have Walensky?
Go ahead and dismiss the class, and you can stop recording after dismissing the class. Hi, Hudson Hut. Dismissed. Go do great.